please be seated. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Please open your Bibles with me to the book of 1 John, chapter 2. We'll be reading verses 18 through 27 today. That can be found on page 1302 of the Pew Bibles provided. Well, we're continuing our series through 1 John, and in this passage, we see John give a stark warning concerning the presence of Antichrist, and he equips his, his, his readers, his hearers, to respond to these deceivers. Hear now the word of God. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things concerning those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true and is no lie, just as it taught you, abide in him. Well, this weekend, approximately 43,500 people will walk through the doors of Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas. And there they will sit under the motivational speaking of a man named Joel Osteen. To put that number into perspective for you, the, the total number of weekly attendees at Lakewood Church is greater than the total number of members within the OPC and the RPCNA in America combined. It is a staggering number, but it is also a very scary number. Because each week, more than 40,000 people are subjected to the false prosperity gospel teachings of Osteen. They are told that you can live your best life now, and all you really need is a little bit more confidence in yourself. But Osteen isn't the only one. All across America, there are dozens, hundreds of false preachers who are peddling false gospels. Men and women claiming to be prophets and apostles with special revelation from God. Others have denied core Christian doctrines which the church has affirmed for centuries and which the Bible clearly teaches. And all of this is happening in our own backyards and in the name of Jesus. In our passage today, we see that the situation John faced was actually quite similar to our own situation today. There were false teachers, antichrists among the people, and they posed a real threat to the church. Uh, thankfully, John didn't leave his readers without hope. And he doesn't leave us without hope either. He provided them and, and us with a real countermeasure to effectively respond to the deception of, of these men. And it, and it is this. Because false teachers are trying to deceive you, abide in Christ. And this morning... We're going to look together at four directions that John gives to us, which, which relate to this central command he gives us to abide in Christ. This first direction relates to the necessity to abide in Christ. The necessity to abide in Christ. And it is simply this. Because there are false teachers among the church, you must abide in Jesus. We see this in, in verse 18 where John's emphasis seems not to be so much on the one Antichrist that is coming, but on the many antichrists that have already come. And as has already been highlighted, John's situation and our situation are very similar. There are many false teachers among us today. I don't need to name them all. You know some of them. And you know how many of them there are. 
I want you to notice this, however. These false teachers are not just harmless peacemakers that are sitting quietly among God's church. They present a real threat to God's people. Look at verse 26. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. These false teachers have one primary goal, deception. They want to deceive you. Remember Jesus' words in Matthew 7.15? Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. See, the trick false teachers use is that they don't appear to be false teachers. They, they dress up in sheep's clothing so that you don't even know that they are there. Paul describes Satan masquerading as an angel of light. And because they appear so nice and warm and friendly on the outside, they can make their way into the church. And that is when they make their attack because inwardly they are still ravenous wolves. And they have one intention, it's to lead you astray. So brothers and sisters, this is why we must abide in Jesus, because if you are not clinging to him, you will be led away by the deception of these men. Now if John's message had ended here, it probably would not have given his readers much hope, because it doesn't do much good to tell someone why they should do something, but not equip them and tell them how to do it. Uh, thankfully, John didn't end here, which moves us to our second direction, which relates to the capability to abide in Christ. The capability to abide in Christ. If you look at verse 20, you'll see this beautiful phrase, but you have been anointed by the Holy One. You see, yes, there are false teachers, and yes, they are very dangerous, but God has not abandoned you. He has anointed you. If you look at verse 27, you'll see a very similar phrase, but the anointing that you received from him abides in you. Well, what is this anointing? Well, it seems best to understand this anointing as a reference to the Holy Spirit, which was given to us upon conversion. Acts 10.38 sa says this, You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and power. But this whole concept of, of anointing actually had very deep Old Testament roots. It, it surely reminded the people of times in the Old Testament when fine oil would be poured on objects or people to set them apart for special use in God's service. Remember 1 Samuel 16 where David is being anointed king by Samuel. Verse 13 reads, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. So there has always been a, a very deep connection between anointing and the Holy Spirit. John is saying here, abide in Christ through the help of this Spirit. Well, springtime is beginning to make its way into the air now, and spring has always been one of my favorite seasons because it is a time of, of new life, of resurrection and growth. The grass is green and thick, the, the leaves are growing on the trees, the tulips are blooming. <laughs> well, there's one thing that will never be growing in spring, however, a branch lying on the ground. Why? Well, because as we all know, that branch has been severed from its life-giving source, the tree. And as such, it cannot grow on its own. This is the picture that Jesus paints for us in John chapter 15. We human beings as the branches, Jesus himself, the life-giving vine, and apart from him, we can do nothing. The branch cannot bear fruit on its own. And unless we are connected to the spirit as a branch is connected to the vine, we will fall prey to these false teachers. But if we are connected, what is the result? Well, read on in verse 20. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. Later in verse 27, he would say, as his anointing teaches you about everything. So this spirit gives us knowledge, teaches us the truth, gives us everything we need to know so that we can know false teachers for who they really are, so that we can avoid them, so that we can know the truth in Christ and abide in in that. And before we go any further, I want you to see that this spirit is absolutely necessary. You cannot do this on your own. The spirit is essential. Well, the spirit is certainly uh, essential, but that still leaves the question, how exactly do we abide in Christ? What does that look like? And that brings us to the third direction in today's passage, which relates to the way to abide in Christ. 
the way to abide in Christ. Verse 24, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and the Father. John's direction here is this, abide in Christ by letting what you heard from the beginning abide in you. What it was it that the, what was from the beginning? Well, it was the gospel, the true gospel of Jesus Christ, which the, the, they had originally heard preached to them from the apostles. And so John, amidst these false teachers who were denying that Jesus was the Christ and spreading these false lies, he's saying, let what you heard from the beginning, the true gospel, abide in you. This isn't something new in John's thinking. Remember 1 John 2, verse 7? Beloved, I'm writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that was from the beginning. This is very common for John to, to point his readers back to what was original, what was from the beginning. Matthew Henry said once, truth is older than error. Truth is older than error. So don't exchange the, the old, the original, the true gospel for new and novel messages, despite how appealing they may seem. Abide and let that original gospel message abide in you, and you will abide in Christ. I think these words also have a special application for us as seminarians, because you see, here at RPTS, we have the tremendous privilege of studying the deep things of God. To think, write, talk about many theological topics, and it's a great thing. I think there is a danger, however, in letting the gospel become nothing more than Christianity 101. Of letting it become the first step into Christianity, only to be superseded by studies in all these other theological areas. I want to remind you this morning that Christ, uh, the gospel is not Christianity 101. It is Christianity A to Z. It is the lifeblood of Christianity. It is not something we move beyond in order to study greater things. It is the greatest thing of all. And so as you pursue your studies here and as you move into future ministries, let the original gospel message abide in you. Never let it become secondary. Well, that may make you wonder, what does it mean to abide? I love what A.W. Pink had to say. He said, it is a permanent lodgment in the heart. A permanent lodgment in the heart. Something that's, that's with you wherever you go. I, I have a lot of friends now who are getting the, the smartphones. I don't have a smartphone yet, but, and I don't want to generalize, but a lot of these, these people have smartphones. It's, that phone is with them wherever they go. It's like it's connected to them. They're either playing a game or they're texting. They're not texting. They're talking to someone or it's in their pocket. And if they don't have it with them, it's like, okay, what's going on here? Uh, I'm, I feel lost, confused. I'm a different person because I don't have my, my cell phone on me. And I, I pray that that would be true of us as Christians, that when the gospel message was not abiding in the deepest recesses of our hearts, that, that we would feel lost and, and confused and indifferent that we would not feel right unless the gospel was abiding in our hearts. And, and as this gospel does abide in us, we too abide in the Son and the Father. That is a great promise, and it is a great transition into our fourth and final direction from John today, which deals with the encouragement to abide in Christ. The encouragement to abide in Christ. Well, what is the encouragement? Well, the encouragement to abide in Christ is that you get to abide in Christ. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, I want you to look at verse 25. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. So John is saying that God promises eternal life. Abide in Christ and you receive eternal life. I think another way that John could have said it, though, is this. And this is the promise that he made to us. You get to abide with the Son and the Father forever. Because you see, eternal life is really synonymous with abiding in Jesus Christ. Because eternal life is all about being with and abiding with Jesus. And so the encouragement to abide in Christ now is that you get to abide with him forever. To return to the imagery of a vine and a branch, what happens when that branch is disconnected from the vine? Well, it, it withers, it dies. But what happens when that branch is firmly connected to the vine? Well, it flourishes, it grows, it becomes more firmly connected to the vine. And the encouragement for that branch to stay connected is that it will continue to be fed from the vine and it will become more firmly connected over time. And the encouragement for us 
to abide in Christ is that we will become ever more firmly connected to him and be able to feed from him forever. And friends, what could be a greater blessing than spending an eternity of eternities feeding from the matchless king of heaven, the one who shed his very own blood for our souls? I can think of no greater blessing. And that is John's encouragement. Abide in Christ. Receive eternal life, which is abiding with the Son and the Father. Well, I want to end today by taking a moment to reflect on a man in the Bible, a man who, in God's providence, was deceived by false teaching. His name is Judas. One of the interesting things about Judas is that he was not just some common, ordinary man who met Jesus once and then that professed to follow him and then later fell away. He was a man who sat under Jesus' own ministry and teaching, who lived and walked with Jesus, who probably himself preached the gospel and performed miracles alongside the other disciples. And he was deceived. It just serves to show us that even those in the most prominent positions and even those who have a very intimate knowledge of who Christ is can still be deceived. And... I think at least in this way, all of us are similar to Judas, because many of us here are aspiring to be officers in the Church of Christ, to be pastors, evangelists, missionaries. Don't think that the privilege you have of studying in seminary or the privilege you may one day have of being an officer in the Church of Christ will protect you from deception, because it won't. Remember Judas. And I also want to remind you that Satan especially wants to deceive you, because you will likely have an influence upon many people. And if Satan can deceive you, he can wreak havoc. If he deceives the shepherd, he can take many of the sheep as well. And one of the ways Satan will try to deceive you is through these false teachers. You will encounter them. It's not a matter of if you will, but when you will. And if you are not abiding in Christ, you will fall. You will fall. So, so take heed to John's encouragement to, to cry out for the Holy Spirit to give you a knowledge of the truth and discernment so that you can recognize false teachers for who they really are and endeavor with all of your might to let the true original gospel message abide in you so that whatever false teaching comes your way, you will be able to fulfill John's command to abide in Christ. And when you do that, you are safe because Although you can be deceived, Christ cannot be. Christ cannot be. And when you are secure in the hand of God, there is nothing Satan can ever do to pluck you out of his hand. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we need you so much. We are like branches and we need the vine for any life. Please, O oh Lord, this morning, give us a knowledge of the truth by your spirit. Fill us with your spirit so that we can recognize false teachers for the liars that they are. Pray that the original gospel message would be abiding in our hearts at all times, that it would become a deep treasure to us, and that you would enable us to abide in Christ so that we could spend an eternity of eternities with him, safe from the lies of Satan. In Jesus' name. I pray. Amen.